Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Reinsurance Podcast. I am your co-host, Jared Lee. And I'm Ben Rose. Welcome back to the studio, sir. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Although, I have noticed a change in furniture. I know. We're, this new setup is, we're f- much farther apart than normal. Which yeah, we, is, we've gone for the sort of medieval long table yeah. uh, setup, which, I mean, it's very nice wood. So so if you if this episode feels strange, it's because we're still wrestling with this new layout and the distance we, we are from each other. And speaking of measuring things like <laughs> tables, <laughs> what's, our, what's our topic today, Jared? <laughs> we're going to spend today sort of diving in more to sort of the underwriting principles and pricing and, and lean into some of the nuance of how this industry thinks about these types of things. So um, we've spent earlier episodes talking about sort of nuance of underwriting pricing and sort of things that reinsurers might look like, might look at. Um, and then you have, you've obviously done a number of pricing potential hypothetical risks and things to sort of walk the listeners through that. But I thought it would be interesting for us to spend a bit more time kind of thinking through principles in underwriting, um, how, pe- how firms think about the push towards profitability, how they think about diversification, all of these elements which are ultimately interconnected in, in our space. But first, how about we have a bit of fun? Okay, <laughs> straight, straight out of the Straight in. No, I, I, th- I think it's, it's, it's good to get people warmed up and thinking yeah. about pricing challenges and so on. So I wanted to give you a special themed edition. I, I, I don't know exactly when this episode will get released but it was recently valentine's day mm-hmm. by which i mean within the last three months <laughs> <laughs> i'm not kidding and because of that i've got a special friskris for you okay uh, friskris as, as a reminder we haven't played in a, a while is a game where typically i will challenge jared to identify whether a a risk is actually something that gets insured or has been insured in the past or whether i've completely made it up yeah. Uh, So what I'm going to give you this time is a clue that there have been insurable risks around this topic. Mm -hmm. I want you to try and guess what they tried to insure. Okay. And the topic is love, hence the Valentine's Day link. You see how this is all fitting together now. Uh, So how have people tried to insure love, marriage, romance, etc. in in the past? There's... So most of these will be Lloyd stories because Lloyd's is the <laughs> epicenter for the most obscure types of risks. Um, there would be insurance policies taken out against lips, I believe. All it's manner it's of all manner of body parts. So I think that <laughs> depending on where our listeners' heads are at, we could we, we could go, leave go those. more towards vanity than love. <laughs> <I think. laughs> but, but um, you could make you could make the the claim that life insurance policies are a type of this. For those most romantic amongst us, but I think that's there typically was... how I start most dates <laughs> as a married man. Uh, <laughs> I thought you meant most first dates when you were young and single. Oh, exactly. Talk about life insurance. Yeah. Date one. How do you think I managed <laughs> to get to where I am today? <laughs> Kellyanne's a lucky woman. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think there's a policy, an interesting one. It might it might be the opposite of what you're angling mm-hmm. at. But there was a policy, I believe, written by Lloyd's a, a long time ago. That if someone got married, the policy would take effect. Like it was like an anti-love policy of he's, sorts. He's done research. <laughs> I am impressed. Continue. Um, I don't remember who it was. It was a movie star of some sorts. Um, but yeah, they had taken out a policy because she must have been like a, an icon or a sex symbol or similar where if she was then married, her market appeal would de- would decrease and therefore um, pot an insurance policy against that. Very good. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on with what I was targeting at. And, and all credit, by the way, to uh, the Emerging Museum of Insurance that I believe Paul Miller is, is creating here, right. here in London. But I, a few examples of policies, anti-love, I like this as a, a way of framing them, <laughs> anti-love policies, yeah. I designed to ensure against the risk that a, a star of some kind mm-hmm. would lose appeal or get distracted from their main uh, profession due to love or romance. Who was the... Who I, was the... So there were multiple examples okay. th- throughout the 20th century yeah. of actors, actresses, etc. being covered for this type of thing. I think one of the funny examples actually was a refusal of coverage I, for the English amateur football team I, on tour 
uh, were the, the team trying to ensure their players against getting caught up in romances whilst they were away. Yeah. But it was deemed far too expensive to cover. So that was the one major exclusion from yeah. <laughs> their uh, accident policy whilst they were away. Well, when I remember when I was, was learning about that and if um, or reading about it, and if you don't follow Paul Miller on LinkedIn, tons of super interesting historical insurance cases and things like this so if you're listening paul this is your invitation to get on the show and join us <laughs> yeah oh that'd be an amazing episode um but it, it strikes me w of one that would have sort of a lot of moral hazard attached to it where it, it doesn't feel like a purely chance-based risk right you could either choose to get married or accept a proposal or not accept a proposal it's funny isn't it i, I feel like this this old world lloyd's perhaps because of its uh, smaller society and, and being this lady and gentlemanly type world where, mm. you know, honor and integrity was perhaps, and social standing was perhaps more critical to your place in, in society back then. But yeah. on your word, you seem to get any kind of policy, uh, a place based just on you saying that there was something you didn't want. That whole concept of, surely you can't sell that because people will obviously work to yeah. see it through to conclusion didn't seem to matter. But maybe yeah. it was because also all of those people buying policies at Lloyd's were so outlandishly rich that probably didn't you knew they weren't doing yeah. it for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I think if we go then back to sort of the theme of this episode, you have this this risk, whether it's a, pro a film producer, an agent or whomever that has this, this uh, client whose value would depreciate dramatically should they become married, how might you then understand that risk, price that risk, and and because you wouldn't have it where it's it's a pool of homogenous risk, right? There's not thousands of people who are so horrified of marriage that this, this you, is, you, right? You created a fantastic price it challenge out of my frisk risk. Well, yeah. two challenges in two one. games in one episode. <laughs> I well, because if you think about it, this is something that, as you say. Historically, I don't I don't think there would have been any systematically collected data yeah. to support this. But nowadays, actually, I, I don't know if you've seen the Social Network uh, film, for example, but as a, a joke example, the rating site that Facebook first yeah. started out as, I people have done work to try and identify what the most attractive person might look like, for example, yeah. which you could argue is one pricing factor as to the risk that they would get married. I location and proximity to other individuals could increase the chances of a potential match. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure a huge number of things like age, especially people feeling pressure uh, yeah. to find a match at certain points. Can you imagine using, you know, one of the major dating sites, uh, algorithms mm. or databases as your basis for pricing the risk that somebody falls in love yeah. successfully? and actually is able to conclude it through to a marriage. I mean, there must be some... There's data sources around now, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, even even better, if you think about it, going back to some uh, actually more insured events, cyber scandals, I mm -hmm. when whatever that... Uh, Ashley Madison? No, if I, what's that site? That called? sounds... The adult from dating like, outside of marriage website yeah. in the US. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds right. We're in the ballpark yeah, anyway. Some, yeah. that, but that place, right, so they must have astonishing statistics on how likely your partner is to have an affair behind your back yep. as well, right? right which yep. it feels even more insurable in some ways. Yeah, uh, that would I, I, I would bet that you'll see those types of things coming into um, divorce proceedings and stuff where they'll have, they'll have data surrounding that. Do you know what it reminds divorce me? Divorce insurance would make sense, right? That would be right. a good input into, yeah. so like, let's say it's then less moral hazard in some ways. You just want to have some funds to pay for lawyers. Yeah or to make sure you don't get a raw deal, let's say, if you have a divorce, like insurance instead of prenup, or yep. in a, as, a, as an add-on yep. to a prenup. Um, they could use that to price it, right? What is your probability? There was, on? we've gone so far off topic now, which I love. I, th I think we're touching <laughs> on the fundamentals of pricing here, Jerry. This is, There's, um, this will be hailed as genius and cited in academic papers for years to come. <laughs> We have a deep, a deep pool of academics as listenership that are, <laughs> are writing their their doctoral theses as we speak. Love doctors, yeah, that's who they are. Yeah, but there, um, there was a story, oh, must have been almost a decade ago now. But um, Target, the sort of chain of of retailers in the United States, they because of their data algorithms and like uh, 
that they were catching, getting from like cookies on the, on their website, had identified um, a teenage girl in the states who was pregnant before her family found out. And they sort of, yeah. do you remember this, right? I do. They I sort of they're highlighting Target because they were also a mega cyber hack victim. No, but maybe, maybe. Like, yes. Yeah. It all comes back to insurance. insurance. It all comes back to insurance. It always does. Um, but it'd be a similar kind of thing. We're going. This person who we know from social media and everything else is married, but all of their buying behavior and things that their activities online indicate yeah. that they are no longer, you know, behaving in the way that someone married should be behaving, etc. Um, and and using that to be like the likelihood that they will be divorced in whatever time frame that we've indicated is like I guarantee there's there's companies that have this data and would be. I think what's willing to, to sort of sell products around it. No, completely. I think what's even perhaps more scary is the data to understand what might happen in the future is one thing, but actually the way that that data is pushed now, I sort of proactively towards others, I to almost encourage them to follow a trend, yep. could even be a determining factor in some ways, right? Yep. So I'll give you a great example. The I, I, I don't use Instagram, but my wife does. And whilst we were in the process of organizing the wedding, et cetera, the amount of stuff relating to weddings that mm. she was getting was huge. I, and then at some point it's worked out that we've now finished getting married and now it's just a wall of, you're going to have a baby soon stuff, <laughs> yeah. right? I, which, you know, in some cases might push the probability of having a baby. I, so you could almost imagine this hopefully not nefarious insurance type character being able to, on one hand, ingest trend information, but then also push it back to users. So you could imagine almost if if you could capture uh, engagement with your policyholders, which is one of the things that obviously insurers typically struggle with, yep. could you be pushing to them like, oh, the weather today isn't great for driving, drive carefully, mm -hmm. or you shouldn't carry your marine cargo across this strait at the moment because yeah. it's rather choppy right now. Mm. I've just seen three other ships put out warning signals. Yeah. And you can actually start to influence risk-based behavior with yeah. your, your data sets. Yeah, I, th I think... Minority report of insurance. Influencing behavior is is something that's central to all of this. And and you've already seen it online, right? And um, there was the big thing with Facebook a number of years ago where they intentionally manipulated people's feeds to then see if that was changing their emotions and this mm -hmm. type of stuff, which um, obviously got slapped quite hard for um, when that came down. Um, but when you think about using in, using data to improve behavior, insurance companies have been looking at this for ages, trying to, trying to find ways to engage more frequently with users. Um, I know auto insurers in the States uh, more than a decade ago, Progressive was, I think, leading in this, but introduced ways you could plug a chip into your car and then it would evaluate how you drove, and mm. if you drove well, um, it would it would give you a better rate. And that that sort of knocked on lots of companies are doing something similar now. But it was really a, impactful and effective because it gauged the time of day you drove, the speed by which the you know how hard you braked, and all these different things. And it would give you sort of daily or every mm. couple of days like little feedback and tweaks. And you wanted to save money and have a better price on your insurance, therefore you'd take that feedback to heart. And and I think they're moving towards more of, it's really bad weather today, so if you can avoid driving, you should do, and all of these things to help reduce the, the risk exposure there. Absolutely, yeah. I've, I've heard stories from friends, uh, in particular international friends, who've you know found it harder to get a typical UK driver's mm -hmm. uh, policy where their conditions have included not driving in certain areas. Uh, or if they do, there's a cost added to their monthly bill sort of thing. And it... Probably one of the best examples I've seen of this not in motor actually is in uh, Flock's drone insurance mm. app where you're planning a drone flight, commercial drone flight, and you want to fly over a certain area. And it will tell you, well, if you go into that area, that's actually above a school or it's rush hour or it's very windy at the moment and therefore your price is going to be that. So are you sure you want to? Yeah. You could fly just over here to the left a bit and the price would be much lower. So exactly as you said, it does start to become interactive risk-taking yep. rather than, I think, what we've been used to for decades, which is annually in advance risk-taking yeah. at a very non-personalized level and much yeah. more of a, 
you are one of many homogenous risks. Yeah. Kind of. when, when we think about it from a reinsurance then lens, then what you have historically had is here's the data and the data is what the data is. Right. And I, th I think there's ambitions to to make that more real time or reinsurance is responding in the same sort of frequency. But I don't think that's needed. Um, because what I think you can do then is, as an insurance company, let's use that flock example. You can say, um, here's the premium uh, that we've received this last year, what we think we'll do next year, and here's how we're calculating premium. Not only do we have our base rates, but we have um, surge pricing, if you will. I don't know if they have a... But, but they have their surge pricing, so when the weather is choppy, you can still drive or still fly or do whatever you want in bad weather, but we increase the rate because we know the risk has gone up. So they, they can address that and talk about that in their reinsurance narrative to the, mm -hmm. to the market about how their premium is being calculated. And then they can also show that in improving losses and say, our loss ratio is improving because we're introducing all of these encouraging tools to our policyholders. And then as a package, aren't we a much better reinsurable risk? This you know, and this is they're sort of presenting that that innovation narrative to their reinsurance partners that helps them differentiate from just the company that has a flat price that everyone goes out with, rain or shine, you know, and, and you're competing in the reinsurance market in that way. I think I think that's a good starting point. It it's interesting though, I'd be keen to hear where you think it might go. Because, you know, I think a lot of students suffered at the last renewal season by being treated with the same rule as everyone else, right? It was like, well, you know, the data you presented to us doesn't give us a particularly strong case to treat you. Here's your rate increase. Mm -hmm. I And you just kind of had to take it unless you could prove that we should be treated differently because our customers, our policyholders, yeah. X environment that's special in our case. And I think I, some students are able to show that if they've got good enough data, if they've had time to show mm -hmm. based on underwriter feedback why they should be treated differently often by using tools like Superseed. Yeah. Anyway, side, side note. <laughs> I, but I think what would be much more interesting in the case you described would be having a slightly more dynamic relationship with reinsurers mm -hmm. where let's say there's an event of some kind that affects their market as a client and they want to lean into that or lean away from that. Can they adjust I, yeah. what they do? So I'll go back to my underwriting days. You know, We would have to come up with premium estimates that we would put forward in October before January, for example, mm. and say, this is how much premium we think we're going to write in this class of business in the, each of these regions and types of property, for example, over the next year, yeah. based on a estimate of how much we will have written by the end of this year. Mm. And then the reinsurers in turn would look at that and go, as we would when we were looking at the clients we took on, I and say, okay, so how good was their estimate last year? They were way off, they actually wrote way more or way less than they thought they would, uh, based on this other incomplete <laughs> bit of data they've given us. Um, and you'd kind of take a guess and price on some imaginary amount that they were going mm. to write. Uh, but obviously during the year, if you look at, well, let's say it was an aviation book, you know, and suddenly 9-11 happens or all your flights going to Russia and the war happens, mm -hmm. you might suddenly stop business at that point yeah which is great if you've already locked in an adjustable rate based on volume maybe or maybe mm -hmm. it's not i but it might be that something else happens that means that oh suddenly somebody's realized that flood is a peril and everybody in our local market now wants to buy flood insurance and we only agreed at the beginning of the year with our reinsurer that we could offer this much coverage mm -hmm. which means we can't respond to that market's need which has arise, arisen in september we have to wait till January to get approval to do any of that, by which point all of our customers have gone ahead of us. Yeah. So I want it, I want to see at some point a level of dynamism mm -hmm. enabled by data that lets clients have a conversation with their reinsurer and say, here's our book now, here's how it's been going. Look at this underlying change. We've seen rate, rates change in the last month yeah. in this class. We are able to sell. We've got distribution. We just need your go on this to yeah. lean deeper and you know amend endorse this contract yeah. as quickly as possible before our competitors get there before us i think that trust needs to come from good data yeah i, I think that for that to exist the data has to be better full stop i think when we look at where we see the future of the industry going i certainly think there will be an element of better data will unlock these things i i don't yet pr prescribe to this idea that 
um, the re renewal seasons won't happen and that will be the case. But I could see us moving into a, you do quarterly reviews and it's not like a rigid yearly renewal, but you're looking at books in a much faster window and saying we recalibrate actually every quarter now yeah. and we reset, as you said, because there's, there's a lot more pull here than we thought, or this is getting a bit, getting a bit colder mm -hmm. or travel as a sector has collapsed. So therefore all of these policies should be reset now and they can do that mid cycle. It's interesting, isn't it? Would Those you, things would be interesting. Which side of the table would you want to be able to do that on, I suppose? Because you might, as a student, say, we want to be able to renegotiate mm -hmm. every quarter. And the reinsurer might say, fine, we'd like to also be able to renegotiate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> every quarter. It's, I guess people take comfort from being able to lock in terms for at least a year ahead. Yeah, well, I think especially in classes like pro property catastrophe, mm -hmm. right? Where you certainly don't want to be renegotiating as you see like a cat five yeah. beginning to move. You so know, that reinsurance <laughs> pricing, <laughs> right? Florida is. And I, I've been in the market when um, post Ahoku when the renewal was coming up and they just the, the dust had not yet settled yeah and so what every all the big clients did was extend their policies their mm -hmm. annual policies they essentially took the existing terms um bought a three month or four month top up on that mm -hmm. at the same at this flat rates essentially all the partners agreeing we don't yet know how bad this is going to be for everybody let's yeah. just keep everything in force let's keep everyone protected and then we'll reassess um a bit later and do a nine month policy or uh, eight-month policy and then start again mm -hmm. annually from from that one so i i think the idea of breaking the annual cycle as you said also removes the comfort of going that's mm -hmm. us for the next year and we'll see how things play out so it's tricky but the dynamism piece we we talk a lot about how our industry responds to the needs of cons of of their clients and i think they've be they've addressed it a little bit with something like sliding scale commissions right where they're saying You've promised me a lot with how good your new underwriting model is, and we're happy to reward you with a better seating commission if that's the case. But I'm not just gonna get, I'm not just gonna let you run wild with what you've told me. So if you had this unbelievably good profitable business, profitable business, great. Here's your commission on that. But if it's less than that, your commission is gonna come down, and less, and then you you know tear right right the way down to then help align interests in that in that way. So I think there's an effort to do that, um, that dynamic alignment with uh, the the client's behavior and their um, underlying base of book of business. But it certainly isn't the point where they're renegotiating the, the core reinsurance mm -hmm. terms in that same window. And we talked about better data. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the industry is at in terms of new sources of data? Um, I think the underlying insurance industry is doing some really interesting things mm. there. Um, and that was kind of the, the angle I was going for with how it impacts reinsurance is I don't yet see a direct connection there. Like if I can, yeah. if, it, as, if I'm a motor insurance company and I can get all of my real time, like what time of day, what weather conditions, microclimate stuff, all of this, that's helping me understand any individual risk. But when it rolls up to a portfolio or a treaty purchase of my motor, of the motor book, this is interesting, isn't it? it? It's it's harder to be like, but Ben only drives in, the, <laughs> right? It's, it's it doesn't really impact the the broader narrative. No, I think you're right, but I think there must be quite good ways of aggregating this as mm -hmm. well. That I think, again, if we weren't so snowed dealing with the basics, yep. we could probably start to explore uh, because. Maybe it's a way of expressing by band your driver types. You know, we've got this many drivers who drive less than five night hours a week, mm -hmm. for example. If night is dangerous, again, I've never written motor policies before. Or we've got, you know, if you want to see our profile banding by city hours driven versus country hours driven, uh, like an urbanization metric, right? So you're looking at this portfolio of motor yeah. scores based on the telematics data and you're able to get a high level portfolio view. Uh, someone's going to start a new startup now after listening to this. <laughs> you're, but, but you could yeah. start to understand a portfolio based on some really critical things. You know, like tell me what your book is made up of in terms of driver personas based on their driving habits yeah. at a high level. And you might see a massive difference between uh, to pick two big UK carriers the Avivas and the Admirals and sure for fun, the RSA, you know, buyers. It might be that one's got a portfolio of like uh, commuters 
Yeah. And one like city commuters and one's got a portfolio of a uh, midday, you know, like low countryside driving yeah. plus the occasional long journey to the beach. Yeah. I, I think it's a super interesting idea because you're right. Currently, one, because the, the underlying data isn't very good oftentimes yet. Um, and and you'd have it where you have banding lists. I think, I yeah. think you see this a lot in motor, but it's like basic age bandings, like 18 yeah. to 34 and 35 to 45 and this kind of stuff. And they can say, how many people fit that? Mm-hmm. And then you have basic bandings where how many policies have this deductible and this uh, limit or or similar. Um, but you're right that you could make it vastly more granular. How many people, okay, they're only 19 years old, but they live in a rural town that has like yeah, yeah. one roundabout and it's like never had an accident in the whole town. Um, so that that individual, be, despite being 19, should not be paying like 19-year-old London prices with yeah, yeah. that motor policy. Um, but the other thing that comes into play here, especially from a reinsurance angle, and you touched on this earlier on, is there is this need to have a bit of a historical lens. So whilst I can go, great, my data this year looks like this, mm-hmm. we kind of need to do this for the next few years and then go, okay, one, you need the data that you can sort of dynamically dice and see what trends are underneath it but if you have it where the toolkit you have allows you to do that work Mm -hmm. but then also see what that impacts for your last sort of three or five years then you could have a very very interesting conversation with your reinsurers about here's how we think about the subcategories of all of our book and where we want to invest more where we want to win clients and where we're trying to sort of leave those policies for other carriers who, who we're not as interested in I think this is where the efficiency comes in again, because as much as obviously motor insurers or home insurers or whatever have volume that reinsurance underwriters can't get near and wouldn't want to, we do have volume in reinsurance as well, particularly because everyone's taking a small piece of lots of different insurers' portfolios. And the effort involved in pricing many portfolios, we used to do like, you know, hundreds a year. I uh, mostly all at one one as well, yeah. which is a lot of policies, a lot of portfolios to price per day in a, you know, one month period, you might have to do 30 a day kind of thing to yeah. be able to keep up. And that has, I think, put a lot of pressure on brokers in turn to make sure that their client's data is presented in a relatively consistent way, regardless of the individual customer's nuances. Yeah. I could we could we see that changing maybe uh, if enough of the customers were able to provide similar fields similar analyses or some of the big brokers maybe were going to say all right all of let's say aeon's clients are now going to present to underwriters with this extra exhibit that they only get because they work mm-hmm. with aeon for example maybe that would lead to change but i think a lot of markets so a lot of clients and brokers are afraid of adverse selection if they show too much Yep. Right, they benefit from the gray, or well, historically, I think they benefited from the gray mm-hmm. in a soft market, but now in a hard market, yeah, it's how do you differentiate yourself instead? So almost the other way around. Yeah, no, I I think that's right. I, I mean, that dynamism must also then be shared by sort of pricing tools that the either the the reinsurers have or the brokers have around how they assess and evaluate the risks that their clients bring them. But if you had it where, if we use this banding example where all my pricing model says is I can apply a weight to each band or I can apply a metric to, of, of some calculation that comes out of each band, it doesn't really matter if I have six bands or four mm. bands or 40 bands. I can just sort of throw, so I could very easily, okay, here's the 40 bands my client has given me across all these micro banding of profile types. Um, and then I can evaluate the performance of each of those mm. bands very, very quickly. It actually wouldn't be that much more work if the underlying structure, as you say, is relatively consistent. It gives the flexibility for that carrier to be more granular, yep. but also that same flexibility to the downstream brokers or reinsurers to assess and evaluate and ultimately price that risk with that additional granularity because you have that consistency there. So I think we're chipping away at all those things that yeah. you know the momentum is very clearly moving in the right direction there. So I think that's something that's easily something we'll see in the next few years. Yeah. And it's interesting, even if we don't, there's this ancient term, maybe not ancient, if that's if that means thousands, probably a technical definition of when you're allowed to say ancient. <laughs> there's a very old term. <laughs> Our academic probably listeners often, are shouting it. I know, I know. Probably often expressed in Latin, but I follow the fortunes. Yeah. It's sort of a founding principle of insurance. 
and I think especially reinsurance, in the sense that as much as you might try to understand an underlying portfolio, you are taking the portfolio as it comes. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time you can put in some terms, but they're going to be pretty standardized. I Across the market, you're going to be one of many reinsurers. So it comes down to choosing a partner mm -hmm. a lot of the time. I think it's incumbent on the client and the broker to be able to pitch why that client is going to be a really good person to partner with, a really, mm -hmm. really good corporate person yeah. to partner with, regardless of what they write and how they deploy telematics or how they deploy IoT devices, whatever it is that they're doing at the, un at the ground level. Mm -hmm. How do they make themselves as appealing as possible to a reinsurer that knows they're not going to get all of the data coming through yeah. such that that reinsurer has the comfort to support them more strongly. Yeah. And, and we haven't on this podcast spoken in, in much depth about um, the likes of Lemonade and Metro Mile and, and the big U.S. sort of insure tech carriers. Um, but I think that was a lot of the promise that they had was bear with us for the next couple years mm -hmm. because they were going to get data, because the way we're going to use AI and our claims calls and, and pricing and onboarding and all of these things. We're going to transform how this risk looks. And over the next few years, we're going to have fundamentally better, or profoundly better risk profiles and data than anyone else in the market. Um, and you have like Adrian Jones and, and Matteo doing the sort of the analysis of these firms. But now that they've had four or five years, their results are very similar to yeah. good carriers, right? <laughs> and and so I think it's let a lot of the, the market down in that sort of this is the Mm -hmm. how this will transform and reinsurers getting really excited about what that might be and riding that out for the first few years only to then realize that it's a little bit overpromised. Not to say that I don't, I don't believe in where that goes. I mm -hmm. think that is very much the future of how our industry will evolve. But I do think sometimes we get excitable, like yeah. you and I especially. <laughs> um, but you see where the future might take us and it's very easy to get like, this could be very, very cool if it works the way we want it to. Yeah. Um, but we have to sort of continue to work at like the baby steps of iteration innovation that will happen there progressive being the sort of first real mover in that kind of space yeah it is fascinating again i mean we could do a whole other discussion on and we should according we should schedule this at some yeah. point a discussion about the rise of the full stack in short yeah. and their proposition and how they use pricing and so on yeah, but unfortunately no longer time for it in this one exactly we're gonna have to wrap up before cordy throws his whiteboard <laughs> at me thank you everyone have a good day. We'll see you next time.